So, uh, surprise, we have two presentations today. Uh, we were going to make it just naturally with processing, and then uh, Fani was like, we should do GANs as well, and so we were like, why not do both? Um, and so today I'm going to be presenting about generative adversarial networks. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit about what it is, and we'll have a total long workshop on how to build one. If you look in the Slack, I dropped a notebook there that just loads the default data set. And so if you have that up by the end of the presentation, I'll uh, just start coding and you can code along and build your own account. But let's just jump into first principles. So I'm going to break down GAN by each of the terms in its name. And we're going to start with generative. Um, generative just means that it takes in one representation and generates another representation. You can think of this in terms of creativity. It's a bit of a stretch, but the idea is the computer is going to intuit something that isn't necessarily just a one-to-one -one mapping. You give it a category of things that it's supposed to map to, and it finds things in the range that are like that. So generative networks will generate something that has never existed in the real world. Um, one example is that example on the right, which is the pix to pix network, um, and that takes in a sketch of an article of clothing or an accessory, like a bag, and it will produce um, a textured version that looks realistic. So this maps from the realm of sketches to a real representation. Kind of the opposite, uh, if you look at the image below that, uh, that is unsupervised cross-domain image generation. This goes from a real representation of a famous individual, like a picture, and creates a bitmoji of that person. Um, so it's not necessarily just going from like a cartoonish representation to a realistic representation. It can map between any two uh, problem set regions. Uh, up into the left, we've got a uh, semantic manipulation image scan, and that takes a semantic map where you can sketch out blue meaning car, the um, violet there meaning brown, uh, and it will take this map and it will produce the textures for uh, those areas. NVIDIA has something very much like this that allows you to actually paint with a brush, kind of like in Photoshop, uh, different landscape features like a, um, like, water or uh, a mountain or trees. And just by painting these colors on the screen, it'll take that map and produce um, a realistic image of all of this. Uh, and probably the most dissimilar to all of these is um, stack in the bottom left there, which takes in text and actually produces an image of whatever is described in that text. So these models are really interesting. Um, they, they can be uh, creative in a sense, and I think it's one of uh, one of the coolest visual applications of um, uh, artificial intelligence right now. Moving on to adversarial and generative adversarial networks. Uh, this refers to the way the GAN is trained. So at the end of the day, we want a generator. We want something that takes one representation and converts it into another representation. But when we're training it, we need a discriminator. Um, and we'll walk into the training cycle and go through a little bit more detail, but in essence, the discriminator, or the, the generator, generator's uh, job is to take in one representation and produce another representation, and the discriminator's job is to take in real images of that final representation and then the generated images created by the generator and classify which is which. It wants to be able to peg the generator and say, hey, this, this is fake imagery, it's not real, um, I'm, I'm flagging that it's not real. Um, and as, as these are trained in tandem, it creates a system where one improves another. And this is a really powerful system because humans don't have to go through and label each one by hand. We actually have an artificial neural network training an artificial neural network. Um, and that makes GANs very powerful and uh, interesting to train, but also, uh, very finicky with, with training because it's a zero-sum game between these two networks and they're always fighting each other. Um, we'll get into that a little bit in the um, code along. And of course network. Uh, this this uh, generative adversarial network is based off of artificial neural networks, which we've been studying for a couple weeks now. So 
things like convolutional layers, dense layers, activations, all those aspects that we've been studying, those building blocks will play a part when we're building GANs. All right, let's, let's walk into the, the training steps here. So the first step in training a GAN is um, training the discriminator. In our example, we're going to make a GAN that, uh, that, that will uh, create an image of a dog from just random noise. So when we're training the discriminator, what we do is um, pass random noise to the generator and it creates its best representation of dogs thus far. And we have a small data set of real dogs that we, um, that we combine with these generated dogs, shuffle them around, uh, and have an attachment of uh, like a label to each one. So we will know which dogs are real and fake. But when we pass this shuffled data set to the discriminator, it will not know. And its job is to match those labels with its prediction. So the, we have this mix of generated and real dogs, and the discriminator gets it, shuffles through all of them, and says this one's real, this one's fake. Um, it does a comparison at the end, and we see how well it does. And over time, through this process, it will learn how to pick out the patterns that the generator is making. Yeah, Grant? So this say it will be fairly easy for the discriminator because our generator is not trained at all. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll skip ahead a couple slides just to kind of show you. So in the beginning, the, the generator is just out of noise. And by the end, it's going to output a picture of a dog after it's trained a lot. So in the very beginning, the, the discriminator is going to have a very easy job because it's like, oh, this is clearly just pixels and this other thing kind of has structure and representation that the convolution is going to have. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, sweet. All right, jumping back. So, and the discriminator wants to correctly classify uh, which dogs are fake and which dogs are real. After we train the discriminator, we do this, uh, we modify the network um, in a way, it's called freezing layers. Uh, and what freezing layers does is, um, it will make sure that when you back propagate through the layers, um, none of the modifications, the updates, are actually applied to frozen layers. This is really important because when we're training the generator, we don't want to train the discriminator at the same time. We want to train them separately so that one has a static target. If both targets are moving around, we don't really get a good signal for the generator to train off from the discriminator and the discriminator to train off from the generator. Yeah. Are these within one network? but you're differentiating between the generator and the discriminator between layers or something, or are there two different networks? That, that's a really good question. So um, with this, the generator generates the images outside and we train the discriminator alone. So we shuffle the data sets uh, with the real and fake images, and then the discriminator just sees this data set of real and fake images, they're not coupled. Uh, so we're training the discriminator alone here. With this, if you see, we pass in the noise vector, we generate a dog, then we pass through the discriminator. That's all one sequential network. Um, and so this discriminator is the same discriminator that we're training uh, back in the previous slide, but, th but this one specifically is going to be trained in tandem with the generator in order to back propagate those values and update the generator. Yeah? So structurally then, are both our generator and discriminator are part of the same neural network, but when we're training the discriminator, we're kind of able to slice it open and just feed data directly into the discriminator layer itself. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the way we're going we're gonna to do this in TensorFlow, and, and the way uh, layers work is you can pass a layer into several neural networks. So we're going to have one network that is our, our GAN, which is the generator and the discriminator together. And then we're going to have a reference to just the discriminator layer. And so with our first pass training the discriminator, we'll just train the discriminator layer. But then when we pass, when we freeze that layer and um, train the GAN as a whole, all the updates applied to the discriminator itself will be applied to that GAN model. Uh, and so we have the, the discriminator subset of the GAN network is um, trained as a separate part as well. Uh, did, sorry, that, I guess, yeah. did that answer your question? Um, all right. Any other questions before I move on? So training the generator. Um, we, we pass in a noise vector, vector a noise vector into uh, the generator. The generator makes a dog, 
image, its best representation. Uh, and then we pass it into the discriminator, which, which is frozen. And so the discriminator doesn't update per batch. So the generator has a solid target to play to. And its job is to figure out what the discriminator is learning in order to, to um, classify something as real or fake and then fool it. Um, and to do this, we actually label all of these images as, as real, which seems kind of counterintuitive. But if you think about it, that's just flipping the loss. It's saying, we're going to reward you for everything the discriminator does wrong. So by labeling all of those images as real, whenever it finds a fake image, uh, the loss goes up. Uh, and so you could think of this as a, as a zero-sum game where the discriminator has the exact opposite loss as the generator. Um, and when the, when the generator does worse, the discriminator does better. And when the discriminator does worse, the generator gets better. So we keep going around in this circle um, until the discriminator is basically guessing. We want to get to the point where it just throws up its hands and it's like, I can't really tell the difference between these two images. There's two options, so the best probabilistic chance I have is just flipping a coin. So once we get there, we know that the generator is doing its job. Um, at that point, we can just cut off the discriminator and we can grab that generator piece of the network, and that is what you deploy to production. That's what actually takes that sketch of the bag and turns it into a realistic image of the bag. Yep? What exactly is the noise vector? Is it like an actual image of random noise where each pixel gets kind of transformed by a generator, or is it something smaller, more like a random scene that gets expanded upon? Usually it's just like a one dimensional vector. Um, so it could be that that um, vector could be as many numbers as you want. So it could be like a hundred numbers in, in one dimension. Um, and I'll uh, I'll just quickly go through this slide. Uh, so we train the discriminator and generator until it uh, until the generator gets to a certain point where it's constantly fooling the discriminator. Um, but to answer your question, Grant, the um, you could think of the noise vector. If it's two dimensional like this, as an x and a y coordinate, um, it indexes into this problem space, which is the generator's representation of the problem space. And as you can see there, those modes, those hot spots, actually represent different types of animals in this network that is creating animals. So um, if you put in like x as, if like x, y is like 0, 0 is the top left, um, like 120 would be. That, uh, that dog that's the second from the top there. Um, and so, in essence, what the, um, at, at first, the generator just has kind of like a uniform problem space, and then it kind of shapes these mountains and valleys into what, what it conceptualizes as uh, these different types of animals. Uh, and, and that's one like geometric way you can look at what the network is doing. Uh, and so it goes from the output noise in the top left there to learning how to make dogs in the bottom left there. Um, and multimodality is uh, an interesting challenge in, uh, in GANs. Usually you have this thing called mode collapse, where if you don't have special losses and specialized architectures, you won't get something like this. You'll actually get one giant mode right here in the, in the middle, and it will be amazing at classifying just one cat, for example, but all of these will fail. And that's because it will find like the thing in the data set that is the most, uh, the most present, and it will just focus on that. So there is a, a bunch of things that you could study that allow you to represent a wider problem space with many different types of animals or uh, anything else. Yes? Yeah, so, so yeah, you do alternate between training the discriminator and the generator, and you do that for each uh, epoch of your, of your training. Um, and then you can, one heuristic is like once the discriminator is completely guessing and it just doesn't understand what the generator is doing, that's when you stop. Uh, but that, that brings up a problem if you think about it. Because what if the discriminator is really good and the generator just starts out with no knowledge? You might get a scenario where the generator can't get a, get like a foothold 
in any one direction, and everything it does just fails. And at that point, your generator will never train because your discriminator is too good. The opposite can happen too, where your um, your generator can be so good and your discriminator just so poor that it'll actually go to the point of like flipping a coin really early on, and your generator won't be great. So the art of GANs is how do you make sure that these networks grow in tandem? How do you make sure that they're worthy adversaries of each other? And there's a ton of papers on that. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to do effectively. So if, if you look at the noise here and um, this, this problem space here, you can see that th there's one interesting aspect of this, and that is it's, it's continuous. X and Y can be represented as, as float values. And if, if you know anything about animation, if you have continuous values between each other, you can do this thing called interpolation. And you basically go from point A to point B in small steps, and it looks like the values are changing slowly. And so you'll see this a lot in um, GAN representations over here, um, where you can interpolate through the noise by feeding in different noise values. And um, the noise values close together actually come out with frames that are, uh, are very similar. So you can see that they don't just jump to different representations of people, they, they slowly change in this very strange and alien way. Uh, it's always interesting to look at. Uh, but yeah, that, that's one of the powerful tools of, of GANs that it, it codes different features into the noise. It figures out, it says, okay, the first value of this noise, like the X value, we're going to make hair color. And then the, the Y value, the second value, could be hair length. And making sure that the model does this sort of mapping to something that's humanly coherent is a, another art form in creating these networks. And you can do this through regularization where you punish the model for being too complicated and it forces the model to uh, encode in a single dimension some aspect of, of the person here. Uh, and as this gets better and better, this can be used as an artistic tool, almost like a paintbrush, because it becomes deterministic and it and you can kind of um, intuit what it's going to do. Um, so, yeah, th this aspect is a very interesting part. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, the bottom left there, um, you can actually do, quote, math with GANs. So we have this math equation where we have man with glasses minus man without glasses plus woman with gla without glasses equals woman with glasses. So you can, and, and this representation of man with with, without glasses, are the noise vectors that produce those images. So, since these are just vectors, you can do vector addition and subtraction, and logical things like this um, will sometimes turn out in ways that are very predictable. Um, so, it's definitely just something to think about because, yeah, if, if it's that deterministic, you can probably use that as a very interesting tool. All right, so we're going to step through the, the training process one more time. Um, so to train the discriminator, we create a fake image with the generator. We mix it together with samples of the real images from our data set, and we attach real and fake labels. In our case, it's going to be ones for real and zeros for fake. We feed them into the discriminator for training. The discriminator uses binary cross entropy to determine which values uh, to, to um, basically compute the loss and do the back propagation. Um, and then after we train the discriminator, we train the generator. First thing we do is freeze the discriminator weights. We feed the we feed noise into the GAN to generate images. Uh, we attach those real labels to those fake images in order to reverse the game uh, from the perspective of the generator instead of the discriminator. And then we train the generator off of those results, um, which is the entire GAN as one big piece. All right. Are we ready to build this thing? Let's do this. Um, so if you pull it up, um, I'm going to be working on this copy so I don't interfere with any of your individual uh, copies. Yep. Uh, so how long, so how long do we train each one? Each of the is there like a threshold value or just like a 
Um, so we, we train it based on the loss. Uh, the discriminator is how how accurate is it at actually finding the fake images? And the, the generator is how how good is it at flowing the discriminator? So that that's the high level of it. Um, but I'm, we're going to walk through the code now, and that might make it a little bit more uh, illustrative. All right. So. Uh, does everyone have it pulled up? Who, who's going to follow along? Anyone? Uh, does everyone have it pulled up if you're following along? Or, uh, yeah, okay. Sweet. All right, we will get started then. So the first thing we need to do is actually create these two networks. So we're going to create a discriminator first. Could you uh, zoom in a little bit? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I can make it even bigger. How's that? Is that too big? Or? All right. I'm going to go one back so I can, I can see on this screen. OK. So this discriminator is going to be a sequential model. And we're just going to pass it an array of layers. Uh, the A few things to note. These images are, um, I believe, 28 by 20. And so the input layer is going to accept an image that's 28 by 20 by 1. Um, because the last layer is going to be uh, the, the channels, and that will allow us to do convolutions on it. So our first layer is going to be a convolutional layer. So it's layers.com2d. Uh, In one sec, I'm just going to run these so we have access to all of this data. OK. So. We're going to go with uh, 256 filters here, uh, kernel size of 3x3, three three, and our strides are going to be 2. So the kernel size is the size of the actual kernel that's passing with the image. The, um, the strides are how far that kernel moves per iteration as it windows over the image. Uh, and then, of course, we need an activation for all of our neural network layers. We're going to go with um, ReLU for this. And then since this is the very first layer, we have to put in an input shape. And that is going to be 28 by 28 by 1. Or 28 by 20 by 1. And what's the one again? It's, it's the channel. So in, in this case, um, the image is black and white. So it's just a single uh, value that represents the grayscale value. But if we were training on colored images, uh, like, see, the, these are just black and white, but if it had an R, G, and B color, that would be 28 by 20 by 30. Um, and in Keras, convolutional layers expect there to be a channel. So while we can technically represent this as 28 by 20, um, when you pass it into the layer, it's going to uh, throw an error because it's going to be like, you have no channels. I don't know what to do with this. All right, so we've. We've got that convolutional layer. Um, and then we're going to put in a uh, batch normalization layer after. So layers uh, batch normalization. And what that will do is it'll just make sure that the numbers are approximately normally distributed around zero. Yes? For the stride in general, is there a reason you pick three to it? Um, that, that is a good question. So strides? will determine how the image, um, basically, if, if your stride is 1 and your pattern is same, the output image is going to be the same size as your input image. If your stride is 2, your image is going to be halved uh, at your output. Um, and so I'm, I'm making strides 2 so that it, um, it has to basically encode uh, the representation of the image in like a smaller and smaller form as we go through the network. Another way to do this is add a max pooling layer, but I found that strides are working better here. Um, and that reminds me, uh, we also need to say padding is same here. And that will just make sure that um, it will pad with zeros uh, in the case that, um, that the image isn't perfectly divisible by that kernel. All right, so. Comma, sorry. Comma? Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Definitely keep calling those out because it will make a few mistakes. 
Um, all right, so we'll just add another convolutional layer and make this one 128. Um, you can type it out, but I'm just going to copy for speed. Uh, we're going to make it 128 with strides 2, activation, really, padding, sing, we don't need the input shape. Um, and then afterward, we're going to need to turn this into a classifier. So, you know, classifiers need to be one dimensional. You basically are given the probabilities of each of the uh, possible outputs. In this case, we're using binary cross entropy, so we're just going to make a dense layer with uh, one value. And to convert this like multi dimensional representation to single representation, we have to layers flatten uh, and then layers dot uh, dense with a single unit and um, I'm going to make an activation of sigmoid here because that's really good with um, binary cross entropy. All right, so we have a sequential model here. Um, I'll close. Oh, there we go. So we have our discriminator. Let's make our generator. It's another sequential model. And this one is going to accept um, the, the dimensionality of whatever noise we're passing in. So we're going to make a, a dense layer to accept that noise. And that dense layer is going to have, um, it's going to have the size of the image that, uh, it's going to be like a scaled down version of the size of the image we want to produce. So uh, if you recall, the image is 28 height by 20 width. So if we're going to make this image while scaling it up, I think a good idea would be to scale it down by, uh, let's say a factor of four. So we're going to we're going to start out with this image as um, each of these divided by four. So that's going to be 20 divided by four is seven, and 20 divided by four is five. So our input, uh, so this has to map to a convolutional layer that is 7 by 5 by 1. To do that effectively, um, we're going to say that the number of units is 7 by 5 by um, some amount of like padding value to kind of pull in more information. I'm going to make that 128. We need to have an input shape because it's the first layer. Uh, and that input shape is going to be however however big our uh, noise vector is going to be. And the, does anyone have a preference between like, probably keep it between zero and 10, keep it simple. Just throw out a number. Eight. Eight, yeah, I, I like that. It's a, you could, it's power of two, probably save space somewhere. Uh, and then in here, we're, we're gonna keep the activation none. Um, I think other than that, we're good on this. Um, so the reason why we're not using activation really is because we're going to use a special type of relu here. It's very common in generative adversarial networks. Uh, and to get to that, it's layers dot leaky relu. Now, what, what leaky relu is? Um, basically, let's start with normal. Relu. Normal really says if you're if the value that's inputted is less than zero, I'm going to output zero. If the value that is inputted is greater than zero, I'm going to output that value. It's really easy to calculate and works great as an activation function. But sometimes you want to represent values that are less than zero. What a leaky really does is it says if the value is greater than zero, I'm just going to output that value, just like ReLU. If it is less than zero, I'm going to output uh, that value scaled down by some alpha value. So this leaky relu, I believe if I hover over here, has an alpha value by default of 0 0.3. So if um, if like our value was uh, was like 30, negative 30, then it would output a value of negative 10. It would multiply by 0 0.3. Oh wait, I think I did that wrong. But you're basically scaling it down to 0 0.3. <laughs> uh, Anyway, uh, so we have those layers um, of leaky relu. Um, I'm also going to put a batch normalization here. Um, 
and then we're going to turn this into a convolutional, we're going to feed this into a convolutional layer, we're going to have to take that, that dense layer that's just one dimensional and reshape into several, several dimensions. So let's do layers dot shape. Um, and the target shape is going to be, uh, I believe we could do, I believe we might be able to just put um, seven by five by one. And we'll, we'll, we'll know when we run it, but if, if this fails, we'll just put the 120 in front. But I think each individual one is seven by five by one. Um, now that we've reshaped it, we could add in um, transpose convolutional layers. So this is going to be con 2D transpose. This is a new one for us too. So uh, I'm throwing it in the mix because it's actually kind of similar to something we've already discussed. It's just the inverse of a convolutional layer. Uh, you can think about it as convolutional layers window over um, a, a broader image and produce like a smaller subset that contains the same information as the broader image. The, um, the inverse, the transpose convolution takes a smaller image and kind of blows it out into a broader image. And so this is really useful when uh, we need to take this limited representation from the noise and turn this into an image. And so what we're going to do is um, we're going to go, we're going to say that there's 256 filters on here with a kernel size of three with a stride of two to kind of mirror what the discriminator is doing. Um, and then we're going to basically do the same thing again here with the, the leaky relu and the batch norm. So it goes convolution, leaky relu, batch normalization. And I'm going to do that one more time. Um, this one with 128. Um, was, was there a question? Did I miss? No, okay. Cool. Um, to fully output this, we actually need to have our last convolutional layer having a, uh, a filter size of one. You could think of the filters as the last dimension of everything, of um, the output of the convolutional layer. So this output is, this output is going to have, um, it's going to be multiplied by this stride, so it's going to be 14 by 10 by 256. So that filter, that um, channels layer has 256 uh, as, as its uh, length. And so then when we do it here, these two dimensions get multiplied again, and then the channel dimension is 128. But at the end of the day, we want our image to have a single channel, and so that's why our last convolutional transpose has a single layer, um, has a single filter in it. So we have now a system that goes from a dense one-dimensional noise vector to finally uh, an output that is of the correct format, because we've we're actually going to have to take one of these out because each time we multiply by, we go by two strides, we're actually multiplying the image by two. Um, so apologies about that. I'm just going to take this last part out. All right. So we got our generator and our discriminator here. Um, we can start by compiling our discriminator and then compiling our GAN. Yes? Do you want to do that last time? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it out. Yeah, I can call. Thank you. Um, so to, to compile our uh, discriminator, we do discriminator or compile um, with an optimizer of Adam. And our, um, our loss is going to be um, binary cross entropy. It's binary cross entropy because of the fact that we're just doing a binary classification. It's it's real or it's fake. It's one or it's zero. Um, so that is going to be really useful for training the discriminator. But if you recall, we need to have both the discriminator and the generator in one network in order to train the generator. 
So to do this, we're going to make another sequential model uh, and call this one GAN. So it's a sequential model, um, and all it is is a generator mixed with our discriminator. And we're done. That's your GAN. Um, and then we have to compile the GAN. And since the output is the discriminator, these two variables are actually going to be exactly the same. So we're going to say GAN, uh, compile, optimizer, atom with a loss of binary cross entry. All right, we have, we have all the pieces we need to start training. So let's create our training loop. Uh, we can just make, oh, yes? Um, where is the, like, why are we freezing the layers? We're not doing that quite yet. Um, we will do that in the training loop. Um, so the, uh, I'll just, I'll describe it before we do it, but uh, to, to freeze any layer in uh, TensorFlow Keras, you, um, you could just, name the layer. So the discriminator is technically a layer. And that's why we can pass it into these. Any model is actually subclass from a layer. So you can like infinitely nest models. Right. And so by, by freezing a model layer, you also recursively freeze all sublayers. So if we want to freeze this discriminator to train it with the, um, to, to train the generator, um, we just set trainable to false. Yeah. And that does it. So even though we're not uh, specifying you know, explicitly an input size for the generator layer of our scan sequential model, it looks at the first layer of the generator sequential model input size? Um, so we've we've specified the input and the output of both of these in their separate models. And so since they have that, uh, the wrapper model can actually intuitively understand the inputs and outputs of each one. We can't with the previous ones because uh, classes like a convolutional layer need to have variable input shapes. You know, we need to tell it somewhere along the line uh, that this is its input. And since we did that in the generator, it's good to go. All right, I'm going to define a few uh, just just a few hyperparameters here. So we're going to define our epochs as uh, like 5,000, and you can play around with these values, but um, I'm going to go with 5,000. So we're going to start our training loop by just looping through each epoch um, in uh, range epochs. So going back to our training process, we're going to train the discriminator first. And we're going to create fake images with the generator. So we're going to call this fake images. Um, and we can just pass into the generator a certain amount of, um, of noise that will produce the, the fake images. So um, we, we, we can call this um, gen input. And I'm just going to create um, some uniform noise. So that's, you could get this from NumPy. It's np.random, random.uniform. And we're going to have uniform floats between negative 1 and 1 um, with a size of um, the, the batch size, which is another thing we should add. The batch size determines how many images we're actually passing in. Um, so we're going to pass in 64. Um, when we're training the, the discriminator, we want about half to be um, we want half to be real images, half to be fake images, and the um, discriminator should know which is which. So uh, just for for clarity, I'm going to make a half batch variable here, which is uh, batch size of having two. Uh, and I'm just going to make sure that's an end because that will cause problems otherwise. So this is going to be of size half batch by um, 
the, the number of um, noise dimensions, which we said was an eight. What is that here again? Um, th that's the number of, of noise dimensions, and that, that's a good point. I'm just going to make that a variable. So moving our, our hyperparameters up the top so it can be seen and used by all, um, we have in our generator this eight, and that is the, the number of noise values that are passed in. So I'm going to make um, Noise dimension, yeah, maybe perhaps. Noise dimension is eight, and then we can set noise dim here. All right, and noise John, dim here. Yep. Do we need to compile the generator layer before it goes into the end? We do not. Actually. Oh, yeah. Um, it's it's because basically with. With the discriminator, you need to compile the optimizer in a loss if you're training it alone. But when we put it in the GAN, uh, the, GAN you, the, the GAN is the one that's responsible for the optimizer and the loss, and the layers in between are just like intuited from that. Um, so we have, we have this generator input, which is just noise, which is about half the batch with the noise dip, and it's going to be numbers between negative one and one. So we're going to pass in the gen input into the generator, and we have our fake images. Um, and then we want to sample some real images from the. Um, we want to sample real images from our array of images up here that we've downloaded. So this list of images up here, um, get here. Uh, we're basically just going to say we want um, images where um, well, we're just going to choose a certain number. So np.randint uh, random this should produce several random integers and so we're going to just find random indices that are within the range of zero and the length of images. And then we want the, the size of that to be uh, equal to the half batch size. So now we have 32 fake images, 32 real images. And we're going to want to combine them into our, um, our discriminator input. So to do that, we can just say np concatenate the um, fake images and the real images. And then we're going to do that along the first axis. So axis equals 0. zero. Um, OK. Now, now we have our data set of images. Yep. So for, for every epoch, we're generating a new random image? We're, we're generating, for every epoch, we're generating new random fake images, and then we're sampling new random real images from our data set. But don't we want the generator to get better? Yes, yes we do. But right now, we're just training the discriminator. Uh -huh. um, so we're, we're going to train the generator next in this loop. Um, so we have the discriminator input, but we still need information to tell the discriminator. Oh, yes, Grant? I understand. Why is it not like generator dot predict and input? Why is it calling generator? That that would work. That would work too. To my knowledge, those two are exactly the same. So you can call any layer as a function, and it will predict, and it won't like train off of it. It'll just act as like a pure function. Or you can call like layer dot predict, and it will do the same thing. So we've. We've got our discriminator input, our real and fake images. First 32 are fake, second 32 are real. Um, we need to pass labels to tell the discriminator uh, to actually train off of this information. Um, so uh, the labels, we call them truth labels, are um, going to be um, the first 32 as 0 and the second 32 as, as 1. So um, we can do this by saying np.array uh, with the first 32 as uh, 0.
And this is going to multiply by half that in order to get an array of 32 single array values of 0. And then we're going to add that to um, an array of 1s times half batch. And that should give us our labels. The period makes it a, a float? Uh, the, the point value? Yeah, it makes it a float. Does everyone understand the array magic there? Because I know that's kind of... <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll step through that with a little bit more depth. So um, let's just take this section and run it. So like, let, let's say I multiply like 0, 0, this 0 array by 32. That produces 32 single array values of 0. Does that make sense? Do you why that happens? It's, it's a very Pythonic thing, and it's a bit weird, but it's nice and shorthand. So this produces 32 of these zero arrays. Um, and we have this dimension here because we technically could have uh, multiple uh, probabilities within here, but since we only have that one dense layer, it's an array with only a single value. Now when we do something like this, where we have the same thing with one times, the, times 32, and we run this, we're going to have our first 32 as zeros, and our second 32 as ones, because we, we create this array, we create this array, this, this first array, and then we concatenate them together with this plus. So we have created labels that match our inputs. And it doesn't need to be within one array? Um, it, it does. Uh, so they, they are within one array. See, it goes a bunch of zeros, and then all of a sudden it changes to ones. So when we, when we have this addition between the two uh, arrays, it just concatenates them together. Yes? Why is it a 2D array instead of a 1D array? It's a 2D array because um, you could have multiple uh, predictors. Like, if we weren't just doing a binary classification and we were predicting, um, like, between 10 categories, we would have that last dimension as an array of size 10, and each of those is going to be the probability. But since we only have one category, it's just one. Uh, yeah, just one unit in that last array. All right, so we have we have the inputs, we have the truth labels. Um, we can train our discriminator. So it's just discriminator uh, train on match. Uh, we pass in the uh, discriminator input, and we pass in the truth labels. You shuffle. Um, so in, in this case, we do not. Um, because there's no recurrent aspect of this, it's just convolutional in networks. It takes every single value as just like, um, it, it just takes each individual one as like, uh, it, it, it doesn't take into account time, I guess. So it, it won't know that the first 32 were all true and the second 32 were all false. But then again, if, if you if you shuffle and it's better, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to know if that makes any difference. Um, in Haskins, I've created it hasn't really. Um, all right, so this was training the discriminator. So we've created fake, we've created real, we've attached fake labels, we've fed them into the discriminator for training. Um, now we're training the generator. So we're going to freeze the discriminator weights. We're going to feed noise into the GAN. We're going to attach real labels to the generated content. And then we're going to train the generator off the results. Um, to ensure that when it goes back around the loop, uh, the discriminator is trainable up here, we're going to say discriminator trainable is true. And then down here, right before we train the generator, we're going to say discriminator uh, dot trainable equals false. All right. Um, now we train the generator. Uh, to, to do this, we're going to work with that GAN model. Um, so we're going to generate um, 
a vector of noise that's it's equal to the size of the batch. So very similar to this gen input up here, we're going to um, say GAN input uh, equals np.random, a random uniform vector um, between negative 1 and 1, where the size is equal to the, the batch size this time, because we're not putting in any real images. This is just training the um, generator, so we're only passing in noise. So it's the batch size with the number of dimensions. Um, and I believe that that's called noise dim. All right, so we have our GAN input. Um, and now we need our, um, we, we need our labels. And we're going to kind of flip the loss on the discriminator, as I've said before. And to do that, we're going to label all these false images that come out as true. Uh, so labels equals uh, form. Yeah, like np dot array of one times sixty four. I think would make sense. What is the np dot array? Why don't we just use a to the array itself. Um, so that's mainly for uh, for safety. I know that TensorFlow can convert between NumPy and TensorFlow very easily. Um, NumPy arrays are also easier to like, work with if you're doing like matrix multiplication or anything fancy. In terms it's just of the style, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. NumPy arrays do kind of cool things. So, like uh, for example, if I will take a really quick detour to kind of show you what it does. So I don't need to cross away. Yeah, it's um, it, it's it's worth knowing. Uh, so twelve thirty four, something like that. Um, NumPy arrays are basically represented are like um, arrays that the data is stored in C, and so uh, they can be huge, and they can, you can do all these complicated uh, computations with them. Um, and they, they will be really fast because all the computations are done in C, uh, which is a much faster than using Python. So you can do things like you can um, you can multiply each element in the array by three. Uh, you can like divide all of them. So you have these like individual computations that you can do uh, as if X is a single variable, but it does this computation on everything in the array. NumPy is a really good data science tool. And so that, that is my little detour. Uh, learn NumPy. It's worth it. All right. So we have a NumPy array of labels. And then all you have to do here is train the GAN with these two things. So we're going to train on batch uh, with the GAN input and the labels. All right, um, and then I'm going to do, I'm going to add in a print statement at the bottom that just kind of like tells us a little bit uh, of information. So we should probably print out um, what epoch we're on. Um, first thing I'm going to do is just kind of hackily add a print statement with nothing in it up here so we don't write anything over. Um, I'm going to put a carriage return here so it continually like writes on the same line. Um, and then I will say, Epoch um, is going to be epoch out of epochs. Um, and it would be nice to know a little bit about like how each of these models are performing so we could actually understand what they're doing. Um, I'm going to have a generator loss. Um, And then the discriminator loss. Uh, and it's going to be this loss. And these are things we haven't done yet, but I'll show you how simple it is to keep track of them. So th this is important because if you run your network and it doesn't work, you kind of want to know what happened during the whole thing. So it's 
it's important to keep track of both the generator and the discriminator loss. Uh, to do this, we could just have these variables as arrays up here. Gen loss is just an empty array, and discriminator loss is another empty array. And this is going to store the loss at each epoch. Um, and it's as simple as when you, whenever you train on batch, it will return the loss. So all you have to do is um, say gen loss uh, dot append uh, loss. And then this loss up here is going to be the discriminator loss. So disk loss dot append loss. So we're always training the discriminator on noise and relatives, right? Yes, the, the discriminator always gets some real images and some fake images, and it's got to figure out the difference between the two. Um, and in that case, the generator is not changing. And then when we train the generator, we just throw in noise, and it automatically keeps the discriminator because we're feeding it through the entire game. But does the discriminator ever do the fake images going into the discriminator ever become something other than noise? Yes, yes. So the noise is here. So this gen input is just the noise vector. But when we pass it through the generator, they become fake images. Oh, I see. So yeah, they, these these are real images that you like would look at and you'd be like, oh yeah, that you could like display that as a PMG. Okay. Yeah. Can you really quickly go over what you mean by hyperparameters? Ah yes. Uh, hyperparameters are parameters that aren't trained by backpropagation. There are things that we have to tweak ourselves, um, and they train like the uh, the model as a whole. Um, so, like the number of epochs you train a model for, that is uh, that's a hyperparameter because that stays the same throughout the entire model. Um, the batch size is a hyperparameter, and if you tweak these hyperparameters, they'll come out with different uh, like. But like certain values will be better than other values, and so there's an entire area of like, um, like kind of like meta hyperparameter programming where you'll actually have like uh, models sitting on top of models that tweak the hyperparameters of the previous model. Um, yeah, which, that was a little too much. Than what you asked for, but was was that useful? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So. I think this is a good place to try running this, but before we go there fully, um, I'm just going to um, add some like analysis after the fact. So we can print out the, both the generator and the discriminator loss by throwing the losses into a pandas data frame. So if you do pd.data frame uh, and then you pass it as a dictionary, discriminator as um, disk loss, and then generator as gen loss, uh, and then put dot plot at the end. It will plot each of these out in a time series, and you can kind of see how they change over time. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course there's something like that. Um, and then at the end of the day, we want to um, we, we want to actually see these images. So once the generator has been trained, we um, want to pass it a prediction and or like pass it some data and have it output an image and then show that image. So the way we're going to do that is um, uh, images is going to be generator uh, passing in np.random.uniform, basically the noise we did before. So we're just going to pass in some more random noise and see what it produces. Um, and this time, the size is going to be just um, a single instance with um, the, the number of dimensions, which is noise dim. All right. We have each of these images, um, and then we can do plt.imshow. We'll actually display this image. Um, and I'm going to quickly move this 
over to this because these are both made with Plotly and if, or with not Plotly, and if you do them in the same cell, they'll actually write over each other, so you'll have a graph over your image, which is kind of gross. Um, so I'm just going to display the first image. All right. Um, everything is roughly in place. Um, how about we, we'll make a few changes later. I think we'll try to run through this and get through a few errors. I think there's going to be a couple. So if we run this, what's gonna happen? Okay. So it does not like the shape of those arguments. Normalization. I'm gonna grab my reference code here for a sec. Alright, so the generator. You can just put them side by side and yeah, help me spot the error. <laughs> Um, no, we is not the same, I don't think. I think we put one instead of one twenty-eight. Seven. Oh, there, there, there's a one in, in here. So it's seven by five by one twenty-eight. And I put seven by five. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Seven by five by one twenty-eight. And then I don't know if it's matters, but you put a zero point one into the weekly row. Ah, uh, yeah. So so we could definitely do that. Uh, by default, it is zero point three. Um, which, like, if you put nothing in, it'll be zero. Yeah. John, yep. uh, your comp, comp can be transposed later than this thing you have in the same that Um, the convolutional transpose layers are, yes, that would affect it. So, yeah. Padding equals same. Thank you. And that, that would actually lead to the, the error we had. So yeah, let's let's try to run it and see if we get better luck this time. Okay. Four dimensions, this one has three. Ah, okay, okay, this, this is an interesting one. Um, so, this is because our real images, if you look at the way they're reshaped up here, um, they are actually only three-dimensional, so we're gonna need to add a new, um, a new dimension to these real images. So we can do that by um, saying real images equals dims. Real images um, and access is equal to one. Anyone want to take a shot at what this is doing? Just so everyone can track what's happening. Yeah? Was it like an array and it's adding a dimension to it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it goes from uh, it goes from being a uh, batch size by um, height, by width, um, which it is now, um, to being that size by height, by width, by channel, which is one. So it just adds that channel, kind of like wraps that last thing in the whole one dimensional array. Um, hopefully with this change. Can, uh, sorry, what did you just delete? What did I just delete? I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, so that that is what the that's what it's going to be afterward. Um, after we do this uh, expand dims here, uh, we just add that channel dimension to it. Okay. Well, it looks like our uh, <laughs> my cool trick did not work. 
but that's fine. Um, and something seems to be off about this agenda. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to run this again really quick, because this is going to get out of hand. So I'm, I'm adding negative one, so it's only going to print out the latest generator loss and discriminator loss. Um, and then for some reason this is, ah, this is why. So we have to say that we don't want it to actually go to a new line. Um, by, by default, Python puts a new line in the print statements. Wait, say that again? We don't actually want it? Uh, yeah, well, one, one sec, let me pause this and then I'll go through it. Oh, this does not want to sum up. Yeah, I'm going to restart the runtime. <laughs> um, okay, so the changes I made. I went to this generator loss and I put negative one there, which means I only want you to print out the last element in the array. Um, and then I go to the discriminator loss and I print out the last one as well. Uh, and then I added n equals uh, just an empty string, and that makes it so that it doesn't print a new line at the end. So every single print will just happen one after another. Um, and what this will do is it'll print out the current loss, and then it'll actually erase that, and then print out the next loss and erase that. And you'll see that in a minute. Um, I'm actually going to move this to a different screen, because for some reason it's making it uh, all right, let's run everything. Okay, so you see how it's printing on the same line? That's that's the trick I was talking about. So now we can just kind of view it live and we don't have to chase it down the page. All right, so I'm going to stop training for now because I've actually got a version of this that already ran. Um, and if you train for 5,000, which takes a few minutes, this is the graph you're going to get. So you'll see that um, the GANs are very unstable. You're, you're going to kind of have this fight between the generator and the generator is going to do really well, and then it's going to, and then the discriminator is going to catch up, and then you get all these spikes because they're going back and forth, back and forth. Um, and Making sure that they're, they're kind of at the, at the same level is, is how you have to tune your hyperparameters and really uh, go iterations on this. Um, and then only 5,000 isn't going to give you that much. But you can see, even with 5,000, it goes from noise to something that kind of looks like a face. Um, and that is a really good start to uh, a generative adversarial network. So, my challenge to you is just kind of take this and like see if you can get clearer versions of the face. Um, I've, I've done this assignment where you were actually able to get like different expressions and there's like no modal collapse. Um, and to do this, you're gonna have to train for longer periods of time. But yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Yes? Will you put your code in the slide? I will, yeah. I will share that. Uh, any other questions while I do that? Yeah, Jay. Um, so what is the the training the training process the discriminator before you train the the actual variables? Sorry, can you say that one more time? How does the how does the discriminator learn about the Um so it it learns from the real images uh, just because we label them as so when we run through that first training loop, uh, which is up here, um, we're, we're mixing real and fake images together um, by concatenating them together like this. Uh, and then these labels uh, will correspond based on index to the real and the fake image. It's kind of just like a normal classifier. Um, and if it correctly classifies it as like a one or a zero, um, that that will lead to the lower loss. And when we when we uh, do this uh, train on batch, it'll actually do a full pass of back propagation and update the discriminator. Um, but you're like in, right now, this generator is running on the it will just be noise, yeah. 
how does the history of the tell uh, the difference between that state and that state? Because so when we're getting into the layers, it's the frozen element of the Yeah, and, like, so, so it's like up here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, like what, what, what did you find? I just, I'm curious. Uh, uh, I found, I mean, I thought you froze the. I can give you an answer that came this way and not from here, but creating the fully disclosure to you. But yeah, we have to make sure we're just going to like a long container. Yeah, there's something I think. Yeah, so I, um, up here, the discriminator is isolated and it trains off of the latest generator um, right here. It produces the latest generator values. Uh, and then down here, when we're training the discriminator, and then down here, when we're training the, the generator, we freeze the discriminator and just train the generator. And so they, they will each have an entire batch to improve on before the next one gets a chance of bettering against them. And so that's how we go back and forth and they build off of each other. Um, and of course, at first, the generator is going to produce noise and the discriminator is going to have the easiest job in the world, but that's going to change real fast. Any other questions? Yep. Um, I was wondering if there are a way to speed up the training for the 5,000 cars? Um, to speed up the training. So you can go to change runtime and change to a GPU. If, if like that's the, the easiest hardware way to speed it up. But um, in terms of just training faster. Um, Optimization. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's probably other, I, I heard PyTorch is slightly faster than TensorFlow, but. Uh, the GPU is faster than the GPU? TPU is gonna be the fastest. Yeah, that, that is a hardware device specifically designed for neural networks. Another question I had was, uh, I know a lot of training pairs are designed to eliminate for loops. Um, is there like a more concise way in pairs to compare to all of them? Um, so like most of the other models I, I, I try to mess around with in pairs, like they do all the you know repeated epoch training for you with that kind of thing, so really spread out for loop for it. Yeah, so um this was actually, I'm sure there might be a better way to do it, like maybe wrap it in another sequential model. Um, I, I, this is the most concise way that I've, I've found. Uh, the default way to do this is actually use gradient tape, which is like the lower level thing behind KRS, and like that's even more <laughs> nested and weird. So uh, generally, this is a pretty good way of doing it. Uh, let me know if you find a, a better way, because I would I'd love to hear it. Uh, there's, there's probably an easier way to do it. Uh, yes? Can you have a troubleshoot the error? Uh, sure. I, I will, I'll circle around after. I, if anyone else has questions, I'll take them first. Yep. Did you follow a tutorial on this? Or like, did you follow like, a master? This was adapted for my 566 class. Um, and that was the code I was talking about to use gradient tape, it was just huge. And so I, uh, I tried to adapt it for Keras and make it a little bit more uh, concise. But you can also go to the TensorFlow docs, and they have a very similar uh, version of this. Um, also, like I'm, I'm sure there's like seven towards data science articles that will take you through the process. So. Uh, yeah, um, and, um, really quick on that same in that same area. Uh, if you're really interested in this stuff, I check out a few things. One of them is uh, DC GAN, which is the very like the first big general adversarial network. That's followed by Style GAN, and that's where you see like uh, all these like, pieces of art generated by uh, GAN. That's Style GAN. Uh, the Cycle GAN is probably one of the cooler ones. That actually takes, uh, it, it goes mapping from the source noise to the end image, and then maps back to the source noise. And so this two-pass system makes for a really robust understanding of both the function that gets you from one another from the inverse function. And so that's a really powerful GAN that's, I think, still state of the art. Um, yeah. All right.
Thank you.